Penn State's got to be careful. If they're not, this class of 2024 could fall out of the top 10. You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, you are Locked On Nittany Lions. Thanks so much for making us your first listen and watch every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. My name is Zach Seiko. I am your host, and I am joined by the recruiting expert himself, recruiting analyst for the Locked On Podcast Network, also publisher for Fan Nation, All Hurricanes. That is Brian Smith. And Brian, I guess this is good timing to catch up with you on a national scale because I know Penn State, if you look at rivals right now, they're sixth in the rankings for the class of 2024. But I'm Penn State fans at least should know that the alarm, maybe it should be sounded, maybe not. But this class has, it might be in danger of falling out of the top 10 here based on just some recent trends. Penn State, I mean, going back, right, you know a lot on the national scale, but particularly down in Florida. So the way that the Gators have been recruiting, they've been missing out on some battles that they were originally winning. I mean, just to name a few, right? Uh, Amaris Williams, uh, Jamonte Waller, and then more recently, Benedict Ume, Nick Marsh. So there's a lot to cover here. But I want to start with that idea. Penn State, are they in danger of missing out on the top 10? It's possible, but I think that based on their coaching staff, especially Cider and a few of the assistants that are such good recruiters, you're going to lose some, but it's still who do you get, and there's always a chance to flip kids. This is a very volatile time. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of kids that make decisions in the summer will still take visits, and I know that some of the kids, especially like in Florida where I live, it's super volatile. I wouldn't worry about that as much. I know, like I talked to Josiah Trader the other day, he still might visit Penn State. Hmm. There are a lot of these kids, they're not going to make true decisions until late November to, to mid December. Yeah, Which, when in fact that they when in fact that they have to sign on the dotted line, right? And I think that's ample time for Penn State. And something that has been brought up is that Penn State still has a shot with some of these recruits, even though they make their verbal commitment. The, the, the true selling point is not an empty Beaver Stadium. It is when you take them to the home opener against West Virginia, when you have them on campus for the whiteout. I know that's part of that's going to be the next wave of recruiting, and hopefully you can get some of those current seniors back on campus that are either 50-50 about their decision or just to re-solidify where they sit with them as verbal commits as current Nittany Lions in the class of 2024. But I've heard that, that Penn State will probably gain some more ground come around with the whiteout game against Iowa. Yeah. I mean, there's not many places that rank where Penn state does for a game day visit. I mean, you can't hear the person sitting next to you. Those kinds of events have turned a lot of recruitments in the past. Why wouldn't they be able to do it now? And it also very importantly helps solidify some of the kids, whether it's unofficial or official that are committed now to stay with the Penn state and any Lions. So I think that Penn State will still end up in the top 10, where at depends on a handful of kids that they're chasing. Because if you get a five-star kid, it can jump you two, three spots. And most of those kids don't make true final decisions until later in the process. We'll see, but Penn State should end up in the top 10, in my opinion. Well, depending on where you look, right, across the industry, it's a little different. Some places, like according to Rivals, Penn State is just outside of the top five. And then in other places, they're fringe in the top 10. I mean, I I look down the list, right, Brian, and I see schools like Clemson, USC, Tennessee that are are still looking to take a few more recruits. Of course, Alabama here. Alabama's... uh, very not surprising to me because this is always the case and I'm not trying to really boost what Alabama already has going for them, but they have eight commits at this point in in late June and they're ranked 31st. That's not going to stay the same. So I see a couple more schools like that, that could push out Penn state. Are there, are there any other schools that might be able to threaten Penn state in terms of where they stand right now? Some of the sec schools kind of wait Alabama is notorious for that, as you mentioned. Yep. Um, like LSU is kind of ranked right, right around where Penn State is. They didn't have any, this is bizarre, but they didn't have any of their in-state recruits take official visits this summer. 
you know they're going to get some of those kids to fall. So LSU can end up moving ahead of Penn State, and you know, depending on who you talk to, they're ranked like ninth or seventh or whatever. Yeah. There's a few like that. But, again, Penn State's in on such a wide variety of kids from Texas, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida. It's going to be more volatile. Picking which kids they're going to get, this isn't Joe Paterno's version of recruiting. Like, he recruited the Northeast and a little bit in the Carolinas, and that was about it. But now this is totally different. Uh, James Franklin looks at recruiting from a very holistic standpoint. They're recruiting nationally, which makes it a lot more difficult. It is a locked on Nittany Lions talking some Penn State recruiting, particularly the class of 2024. Now, uh, they're getting into some heated battles right now. The the jury's not, oh, it's not out yet. Not These battles aren't over, but it doesn't look good for the likes of Nick Marsh, Benedict Ume, and some other prospects. So now Penn State has, adjust, has to adjust and look at the big board. Brian, we're going to talk about that in just a second. But before we get to that, let's hear from our sponsor of today's episode, and that is FanDuel Baseball season is in full swing, folks. And there's no better better place to get in on the Major League Baseball action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That is right, $1,000 in bonus bets back if your bet does not win. Download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything in Major League Baseball. You think Aaron Judge will hit a home run. You think Max Scherzer will go over on his strikeouts. You got a sneaky money line underdog pick. You can take any of them. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets together for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss your chance on the no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on. You can make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. And Locked on Nittany Lions is your go-to podcast for happyvalleyinsider.com. Check out the website for all the latest in Penn State football, Penn State recruiting, and so much more, happyvalleyinsider.com. Brian, let's pick right back up where we left off. And now, uh, teasing that a little bit, the big board changes. Commits, dominoes are starting to fall. Penn State now has three wide receiver commits in the class of 2024. The conversation was that they were going to take at least three then they were going to get four, and now more the merrier five. And the word is out that Penn State wants to get up to six wide receivers if all goes well. One of those targets is Nick Marsh. And based on the latest news, based on the latest rumblings, Nick Marsh is going to recommit. He decommitted from Michigan State, the hometown area school. He's going to recommit to Michigan State, most likely. We don't know yet until he makes the announcement uh, in the first week of July. But Penn State is garnering some interest from other intriguing prospects. Let's take one out of the state of North Carolina, Alex Taylor. I like this prospect a lot. Who do you think Penn State really needs to go after to fill those fourth, fifth, maybe even sixth wide receiver spots in the class of 2024? If you're going to take that many, that means they're trying to get one of the kids that I know well down here in Florida. You're not going to take a sixth guy unless it's an elite, elite player. Jeremiah Smith, Josiah Trader, they're trying to still get those kids on campus in the fall. And if they do, they might take five or six. I'm not buying that they really want to take five or six. Okay. And that's that's just my opinion. You're not going to just take a bunch of flyers. The kid from North Carolina you just mentioned is a very good player. Absolutely take him. If Marsh changed his mind now or later, absolutely take him. But, again, you can always take a portal kid that has more experience etc. if you're that desperate for wide receiver help. So uh, like Tyser Denmark, who they just got, heck of a player, etc. I think they're going to be a little better off than what some might think. I know they need help at receiver, but it's not as difficult to make an impact there as say like offensive line or quarterback where it's more about above the shoulder. So four I think would be fine. But if you know like Jeremiah Smith calls you and tells you he's coming. You find you find room for that guy every time, every time. I mean, he's the best player in the country. So it depends on the player. That'll dictate the number. And Jeremiah Smith has been an interesting case, right? Uh, he had the official visit set up with Penn State. He canceled it. He ended up going to visit, I think, Florida it was, if I'm not mistaken. But that would be 
just to, to get him on campus, to get him to rethink some things. He is verbally committed to Ohio State, but he has taken those visits as a part of the process, as he said. So wide receiver has become such an important position for Penn State. And I want to make this clear to the, the everydayers know this for anybody that's new that's listening. Penn State only has one commit in the class of 2023 that's a wide receiver, and that is Carmelo Taylor. He's a speedster. He's a smaller build type of guy. So Penn State wants to diversify what they're doing at the wide receiver position. So that is why, Brian, you might not be buying into the fact that they're going to take five or six, but for some people, they might believe that even three or four is a lot. And in this case, it kind of is because Penn State right now at least doesn't have that young presence at wide receiver that you would like them to have, at least in the past. These these two cycles need to, uh, or this cycle in 2025, really need to bolster up with the fact that Marcus Haggins is now on campus. Let's flip that over to another position coach that is new, even though he's been with the staff, right? You know where I'm going with this, Brian, and that is Dion Barnes. Uh, he's new in the fact that he's the defensive line position coach. And I said that Marcus Haggins, wide receiver coach for Penn State, his month was June. Is July going to be Dion Barnes's month? I think so, based on the way that things were trending, but then Benedict Ume is leaning towards Stanford based on the latest news. There is still a good word for guys like T.A. Cunningham, who is out of the state of Florida, Brian. I know T.A. real well. He's, he's been all over the map. Um, he's a good kid, but uh, he's got 50 offers. So his, his list has changed about 10 times. The, the curious thing for me is I thought they were going to get Benedict Ume. Stanford's one of those weird deals. Kids either want to go there or they don't. He, his visit apparently went very well. More power to him. I enjoy going four and eight out there is, is how I would look at that. <laughs> but they're not, they're not winning it. They're, they're just, they don't fit the transfer portal area. They're going to struggle. Yeah. But they need at least two big body guys in this class. And I'm a little disappointed so far because Penn State's history defensively is so good, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always been good. And there's some guys somewhat locally – uh, maybe they don't get the kid. Uh, I don't know how you say his name. Starts with a P. I, I can't pronounce David. It. David Polly Polly. Yeah, that's the kid. Uh, they didn't get Waller, uh, etc. You know, they tried to get Nigel Smith. I don't think they're going to get him. That's hard to get kids from Texas to go to, right. to, you know, all the way to central part of Pennsylvania. But they need to get a stud that is a defensive tackle in every class. If you look at, I mean, they're only chasing really. This, I tell this to everybody I talk to. Everybody's chasing Alabama and Georgia. Those two have separated from everybody else. There's a couple others that are, you know, Clemson, Ohio State, Notre Dame. There's some others that are kind of there, but Alabama and Georgia, like their D line, O line recruiting is what separates them. Ask TCU. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, just bludgeoned. If you're going to compete with them, you need Jeremiah Smith too, but you've got to get more depth and, and more guys that can just go after the quarterback. That's what I'm looking at the most for Penn State. And it can happen this next month, but there's they're in on so many guys. I don't know which one they're going to get because a lot of these kids are taken back and forth on where they were leaning, at least what I was told. So I'm kind of like you. I'm waiting to see what happens in July before I open my mouth too much. <laughs> uh, yes, Cunningham becomes a, a bigger priority. But as you said, well, he's a priority for a lot of other schools. Uh, Penn State's not the only one that's recruiting him heavily. And it seemed like just the way that things were going. These are high school kids. They're on social media. Uh, the they're they're on the spot. They're under the spotlight right now. They're in it, and it sure. looked like T. A. Cunningham and Benedict Ume, like you said, you were surprised that Ume ended up going away from Penn State. But that not all said and done. It just sounds like Stanford's going to be the place because, given his situation, he really values academics. And I, I hate to say it, but Stanford is going to beat Penn State when it comes to academics here. Uh, in this case, though, Dion Barnes has a good relationship with prospects like Malachi Williams. Yes. Can they secure really the commitment good. of a guy like Jalen Harvey? I think the fact yeah. that, yeah, they missed on Jamonte Waller and Benedict Ume seems like he's out of the fold right now. But if they can get the ones that they've always been projected to get for the longest time, whether that's Jalen Harvey, Malachi Williams, and then you can throw in a T.A. Cunningham here. If you can get those core three, the defensive line, at least in my opinion, is in a very solid position to at least – 
raise the trend, right? Because defensive line, at least interior, uh, Penn State, uh, Penn State critics have been hard on uh, the middle of that defensive line just because, well, they're not big enough, or they they don't do this right, or Michigan ran all over them. And I get that. Twenty twenty two was not pretty against the Wolverines, uh, and but it wasn't it wasn't the defensive tackles that let them down. However. Let's put all of that to rest and really beef up the class of 2024 because they have some good guys that they are targeting. Uh, is there anybody else that you would throw in that group of the three that I mentioned? Xavier Porter. Um, he's a kid I know uh, mm -hmm. from Tampa Catholic. He's a kid that's gotten a lot bigger in the last year to 15 months. He's a kid that, like, I know North Carolina State would like to play him uh, maybe at, like, nose guard in their 3-3 three, three stack. He's a kid that can be a three tech and, and depending on the situation, play some nose. That's a kid that you could take and you'd be in pretty good shape. I, I, I know him personally, so I'm, I'm a little biased, but Penn state's done a tremendous job of recruiting the state of Florida. I mean, absolutely tremendous. If they can get a kid like that, in addition to some of the guys you just mentioned, Malachi Williams, by the way, is a freak. He just needs yeah. to be fine tuned. He's got tremendous upside, but they do need size. It's the one bugaboo that they just haven't got over the hump with. There's no way to hide that. I mean, you need mass. So maybe they get a kid in the portal or something, too. There's a lot of ways to do this. Maybe they take a Juco kid. They just need more size. Yeah, and it's and all these guys who you might look at a prospect, right, and you look down the list. And I, I'm saying you generally, right, Brian? You understand this. Somebody who weighs 250, 260 pounds in high school – is already a pretty good start. And that's where, and then a lot of these guys are listed at defensive end, but they're going to make the switch over to defensive tackles. So when you see somebody that's recruited, well, Penn State's getting a lot of defensive ends. Eventually, those guys are probably going to slide to tackle because they're going to put on 20, 30, maybe even 40 pounds when they get on the Penn State meal plan, the Penn State health plan that the football team, they just have all the nutritionists and the experts that get them to the, that top physical peak. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm. If you're 250 and playing D line already at the high school level, mm -hmm. chances are really high that at best you're going to be a swing guy, playing strong side end and three tech. I mean, you're just going to outgrow defensive end. You're not going to be a speed rusher at 280. You know, what I mean? yeah. It's, yeah. It's, if you if you are, I want to be your agent. So <laughs> it, it's really difficult. And to be really honest with you. Penn State's only a player or two away from, like, they've got a lot of talent on defense, but they need a plugger that they can count on and some more depth. We're, we're being nitpicky here. But to get over the hump and get into the playoff, quite honestly, that's often what you need. And it's not like, you know, they play Michigan and Ohio State every year. So yeah. life is pretty difficult with that for obvious reasons anyway, and they want to beat those teams. So I understand some of the Penn State fans, their angst. It, it's difficult to get over that hump. And if you look at the ratings right now, again, across any anything, the the gap is so large between the big three right now in the Big Ten, USC, oh, UCLA. That's a, that's a different conversation because that's down the road. But I'm talking right now. You look at the rankings, go to rivals, right? Michigan is number two, Ohio State's number five, and Penn State is number six. And then you look yeah. at the way they're scored, Michigan, 2,300 plus, Ohio State, tw almost 2,200, and then Penn State – 2000 the next big 10 school and it's nebraska they've been a little hot on the recruiting trails of late 1535 so that's about a 500 point difference according to yeah. rivals scale so the it it's anyone's ball game here it's not like penn state is well you know they're getting bullied by michigan and ohio state no they are there they're just slightly behind but slightly behind obviously doesn't get you first place it doesn't win you big 10 championships now it will get you into the college football playoff when the field expands to 12 teams. Brian, our last segment is going to be about Penn State, and you already touched on it a little bit, the fact that they have performed well in Florida. They do already have two verbal commits from the state. And before we get to that, where can people keep up with what you do personally? Sure. You can find me at FBScout underscore Florida, Twitter, and especially right now YouTube doing a lot of videos about kids. It's random. Uh, I just did an interview with a kid from East Texas last night. Uh, he was at Future 50 at IMG. A bunch of the kids that I saw there were, they've been offered by Penn State. It's the elite of the elite. 
And you're going to see a lot of things on Twitter from schools all over the country. Because Florida, where I live, everybody recruits down here, brother. Yeah, if you're not recruiting Florida, there's something wrong with your program. And, of course, you can follow Locked on Nittany on Twitter. Of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you love what we do here. We love what we do here. Follow along. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, of course, wherever you get your podcasts. Brian, in the final segment, you're an expert when it comes to the state of Florida. You're the national recruiting analyst for Locked On. But particularly, the Gators, as of late, have won the battles. Something something changed here with Billy Napier and the way, I don't know if it's just Penn State's being outbid, but it felt like every single prospect that Penn State had a really good official visit with, the word was, hey, if everything goes well, Penn State's going to land this player. And then it seemed too many times that Florida gets into the fold, whether that was Caleb Odom, who's not committed yet, but he canceled and ended up going to Florida. He canceled Penn State. Jeremiah Smith. I know that's a different case. He's verbally committed to Ohio State. Amaris Williams, Jamonte Waller, those ones hurt. I think of Jare Hawkins, the wide receiver, the speed. He's yeah. very fast. He could ultimately run. I think he clocked in at his fastest a four two five. That's that really stung to, <laughs> stung to miss out on him. Uh, so, is there trouble in the distant paradise with the Gators now getting a little more of a stronger grip on recruiting in state? Or, but you already mentioned it. You still feel like Penn State has made a lot of progress with the way that they've been recruiting nationally, but then in the Southeast. I'm not as concerned as some other people because this is the norm. If you look at it, like Alabama has lost a ton of battles already. Alabama. It's just a part of recruiting. You're going to lose more battles than you win. Um, yeah. A comparison, if you bat 300 in baseball, you're doing good. It's about the same in recruiting. You're going to miss on more kids than you get. So, And we're only halfway through the cycle. I think it's the 20th of December is signing day. James Franklin and his staff, Juan Sider and all those guys, they're going to get some more Florida kids on campus. They're going to get some more kids – from Virginia, some more kids from other states. There's a long way to go. And if they play as well as they're expected to play this season, they could turn the tide with some kids they may not be leading for right now. Kids are very interested in Penn State, want to see what they're going to do, and they're ranked high. I wouldn't be surprised if they flipped a few kids that are not with the class right now. So, again, I think they'll end up in the top ten. It's just my opinion, but they're in on enough kids. There's good reason to believe that they will. Let's finish with that then, because I think that's very important. Penn State has to go with that different approach. They're not going to go with, hey, let's cut you a blank check like a Texas A&M. And yes, I will say the Aggies because that's what they've been notorious as NIL opened up in 2021 here and everything's changed ever since. And I'm glad you brought up the Stanford situation because I think of programs like Vanderbilt, Georgia Tech, they are not going to have the same type of success unless they get recruits, but even still guys are going to transfer out, not as many transfer back in. But that's not the point. This is about Penn State. Penn State, they recruit guys very early on. They don't wait till the last second. And the atmosphere, the environment is very important. Some There are some strengths that work for the Florida Gators. There are a lot of other strengths that work better for the Penn State Nittany Lions. And Florida's just one. You can look at any of these programs across the Power Five and say, like, hey, this is what they're best at. That's what Penn State is best at. Game day area, wholesomeness, the family orientation, the emphasis on academics. Every recruit that's ever – like Derek Plaz, I know he decommitted. But the one thing that he said is everybody knew your name. Everybody was was interested in me. I wasn't just a player, even though he made a premature decision. But you seem pretty confident, Brian, and I and I feel the same way too. That Penn State is going to get flips by the time football season rolls around, and this is a team that has potential. The basement is ten and two, the ceiling is twelve and zero. Big Ten championship, yes, a college football playoff berth, and that is going to go a long way to knocking over some more dominoes and flipping those commits that either are going to hold off or and leaning some places or are already. Uh, in in verbal commitments with other programs. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it too much. We got a long way to go. That's it's it's June, brother. It's twenty yeah. eighth of June, so they've got a top ten class right now. They could be in a lot worse places than where they are. So let's see what happens in the next couple months, then get a better idea of it. Do you anticipate? Because I look at 
programs like Stanford who are really already at the commitment. <laughs> they're, they're really at the top of how many kids they've already taken. I think the total, I want to get this right, 26. Are you anticipating that Penn State's going to get about 26, 27 commits for the Well, there's no, more, there's no more limit. The NCAA lifted that. Mm -hmm. So I, we're in new territory. Mm -hmm. We have no data point. I mean, are you running off kids? How many kids leave for the NFL, the transfer portal? We might start an era where 24, 25 is kind of the bottom because so many of these kids filter out. And let's be honest, a lot of schools push kids out too. Let's not get ourselves. Stanford's not one of them. I mean, that's a whole other ball game. But, you know, I, Nick Saban does not care. You know what I mean? It's just true. They signed more kids in the last decade than the other school. Coincidence? No. So, yeah, I, I think Penn State will end up around 25. It could be a few less because they're going to swing for the fences on a few of those kids that are elite, that are four and five stars, and that decide on site that you have no more time. But, I mean, they'll end up somewhere in that vicinity. Brian, I'm glad we could have you on to talk Penn State on the national recruiting landscape to get that full on perspective. I appreciate it. Can't wait to do this again very soon so that we can keep tabs. And I know recruiting is going to slow down here because we got the we got the dead period upon us. So it's not going to be as entertaining. But July, strictly from a commitment standpoint, will be and can't wait to get your takes on it in the not too distant future. Absolutely. I appreciate it, sir. Thanks for checking out this episode of Locked On Nittany Lines. If you like what we do here, follow along wherever you get your podcasts, leave a comment, like this episode, share it with friends and family. Keep up with us on Twitter at Locked On Nittany, at Zach underscore Seiko. And of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Locked On Nittany Lions.